Welcome to the Dark Hedges International Film Festival panel. We are talking about the books that terrified us. I'm Victoria, I'm your host, and I'm joined by Bantelix's very own Joe McElroy. If you haven't checked out his podcast series, Crime Scene to Screen with Therese Ray, it's a lot of fun that I would highly recommend it. And down below, we've got Claire McCulloch from the Omaru Community Cinema. How are we, guys? Yeah, all good. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, all's good. Lockdown not driving is too insane. Not yet. <laughs> no, uh, I picked a bad week to go off work because <laughs> there's literally nothing for me to do. Nothing but, to do know. at all. It's kind of depressing. Well, not but read, so it kind of leads into this here, so. <laughs> Perfect. Well, Claire, you were saying before we started recording that you wouldn't read horror so much as you would read psychological thrillers. Do you just do you not like horror in general, or would you just find yourself more drawn to the psychological bit? Um, my problem is that I absolutely hate being scared. So, like, I hate all things kind of um supernatural. Uh, whereas, like. I don't know what kind of draws me to a psychological thriller. I think it's like, it's kind of more controlled, especially whenever you're reading it. Like um, you've got the option to close the book and like escape from it all if it ever gets like too intense for you. Whereas with um, like the horror genre, I feel like it kind of like sticks in your mind for longer. So you can't really yeah, just definitely. sort of escape it that easily because it'll like not torment your mind, but um, like, if you kind of close the book, you might think that something's coming after you, you know? <laughs> well, if you think you that, you just do your um, job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You could just do a Joey from Friends. If a book upsets you, just put it in the freezer. You'd be fine. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good idea. <laughs> you run out of room yeah. very quick. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Joe, what about yourself? What kind of stuff would you find yourself drawn to? Oh, definitely horror. Um, horror, science fiction, mainly, you know, if, in terms of fiction. Uh, mostly when I read it's sort of biographies and books about filmmaking and films in general uh, like I recently just finished a book which is just a series of interviews with William Freakin and I am moving on to a book about the making of the Halloween series like it goes through each film and there's another part that goes into the sequels that weren't made so uh, but in terms of fiction the last sort of thing I would have read would have been Skeleton Crew by Stephen King which mm. is just a series of short stories uh, that actually opens with uh, The Mist, uh, which was a film back in 2007, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was actually really good. A lot of a uh, lot of great stories in it. There was one in particular that stood out that I really liked, uh, Survivor type. But uh, we can go on that later on anyway, just whenever we get into things a bit more. See, I'm curious that you've just finished Skeleton Crew. I've tried it a few times and I just can't get into it and I don't know why. Oh, Velos uh, Claire? Oh dear. Um, <laughs> she may, she'll pop back, but sure, we can keep going on. Right. We'll, we'll yeah. We're okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, but with Skeleton Crew, um, it is hit and miss, don't get me wrong, but when it hits, it actually is really good. Like the, the story that, well, I might as well just get in it now, that really stuck with me was uh, Survivor Type. Are you familiar with it? No. Uh, it's basically a story about this uh, doctor who... Um, Oh, hi, Claire, hi. we're back. <laughs> Bit I'm of a really surprise. sorry about that. I don't know what happened. <laughs> no, you're okay. Uh, I was just going over Survivor type there. Um, yeah, it's the story of this doctor um, who is marooned on a very, very small island. And there's literally nothing. There's no water source. There's no food. It's just him and a few seagulls just pop, pop it up about the place just to sort of torment him. And... Um, Basically, he was uh, marooned there uh, because I think it was a plane or a boat accident uh, when he was trying to smuggle drugs. And essentially what happens is as the days go on, he just, you know, the hunger gets to him. So at first he attacks some seagulls, like he throws rocks at them to sort of kill them and stun them. And then he would eat them. But then eventually he badly injures his ankle when he was chasing after them. And it's at that point you realize this ankle's going to get this foot's going to get infected so he resorts to amputating it uh. but then again because he can't catch anything now his uh, hunger gets turned so the story is about you know how far someone's willing to go to survive and yeah he goes very far I'll just put it that way and it's it's one of those things it's the imagery of it and it's the way King describes uh, you know his growing descent into madness and how you know he used the drugs that, um, that he was caught smuggling as a form of uh, anesthetic. 
So he's just constantly taking down drugs and it's, it's just everything piling in on, on top of each other and the way King writes that, you know, Descent and the Madness, as well as the gruesome details of what he does to himself in order to survive that just really just uh, just sticks with you. And then it's obviously the ending is the thing that clinches you and just makes you go, oh, okay, I'm just going to close this and put it to the side for now. <laughs> and he, That's very wrong. in the freezer for a bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But essentially I had to put it in the freezer. But uh yeah, that was a story that stuck out for me and I really liked it. I'm glad. I don't know. Every time I try Skeleton Crew, like I get about halfway through the mist and I give up. And I'm the kind of person that can't like just skip stories. I would rather just read the whole thing. Oh, start to finish it. It really annoys me. <laughs> I hate saying this, but watch the film. It's actually better than the book. It's one of those oh, rare really? occasions. Yeah, yeah. See, I'm not like a book purist. If the film's better, then the film's better. <laughs> like, I'm not going to be like, how dare you? Yeah. Well, the well, ending's actually mine's better as well. So, yeah, definitely give the film a go compared to the book. I will I will try. It's probably on Netflix or Prime or something. Mm-hmm. It's somewhere. <laughs> um, in terms of me personally, like, I would be the complete opposite of Claire. I'd be more drawn to the supernatural kind of stories like when I was a kid Goosebumps was my favorite thing in the world my dad used to go to this car boot sale in Malisle every weekend and I don't know who it was but some guy always had new Goosebumps books ready so my dad would always bring me home like two or three and it was like the best thing ever and then oh, when I was good. 10 I read it for the first time and it just it took me about two months to read the whole thing I've got my copy here 40p this cost my dad 40p wow but it took me about two months and 10 year old me didn't really understand some of the more adult themes <laughs> yeah like, i was going to say you read that at 10 i only read it last year and even like mm-hmm. from last year i was going whoa that's a bit heavy even as an adult it's very heavy yeah 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 i i loved it though like after that i was just hooked on horror for the rest of my life and <laughs> scared of clowns for the rest of my life i find out very, well it's very understandable creepy. you know <laughs> Just keep staring at those drains as uh, you walk past them, in case there's any clowns enticing you with balloons and stuff, you know? I was actually terrified. When I was a kid, My I lived at the top of the hill. My best friend lived at the bottom. So if it was nighttime, we were at each other's houses. We would kind of walk each other to, like, the middle bit and run. But there was a drain <laughs> right at the middle bit, and it really freaked us out. So, like, as soon as we got to the drain, we just sprinted. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I can imagine the terror. <laughs> She's watching this. Hi, Nicola, if you're watching this. <laughs> I hope she remembers because it's like in my brain forever. Oh, oh well, this is but, a very like non structured conversation. So, if you have any books just off the top of your head that have stuck out with you over the years or any that you've read recently, just work away. Um, whenever I kind of think of a book that frightens me, I always like keep on going back to Behind Closed Doors by BA Paris. I'm not sure if any of you guys have heard of it, it was released like maybe two or three years ago and um it's about um the the main characters are called jack and grace and basically they're like the dream couple like from the outside they're like the most perfect couple and everyone's like they're so beautiful they've got the most perfect life when really like behind closed doors um (laughs) um (laughs) (laughs) i don't believe i did that um basically um jack is a real like over the top psychotic oh he's just like he gives me the heebie-jeebies even thinking about his character he's like obsessed with torture and not just like torture in like 50 shades of gray type of torture like he's like very like graphic torture um it's it's really extreme and it's a very like intense read but um it reads just like a film so like I was like the whole way through it I had like such high levels of anxiety but at the same time I was like I I need to finish this like I can't put this book down it was so like interesting and it really gripped me and um just the narrative of it and the like just the psychological like horror behind it and what he was actually doing to his um wife and then his wife's sister who um she's she's disabled and he like turns his torture onto her as well which is just oh like God. really gruesome but um it's a good read very good read I would definitely recommend it and it should it should be a film it, it reads like a movie it's very like intense and wow that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's such that's a big thing in horror like 
the, like you said the behind closed doors thing like you can't how well do you really know people that you're that you're seeing even every day like that's it's such a scary thought well I, that's what I think about like psychological thrillers and um why they are so terrifying because um basically like they open up to people's like real people's fears and like what our actual fears and anxieties really are like you know and it's always like you know in the books it's always like the people that are like closest to you in the books and you're always a bit like oh uh, but that's the thing actually even you know funny you say that because like I studied criminology in university and the majority of those kind of crimes are committed by someone you know rather than a complete stranger so that's probably where the author gets you know the sort of ideas from and stuff like that there so but um yeah it's it is uh it's one of those great things in like um you know horror books in general is when you take the ordinary and you put something you know you look at the stuff that's underneath the surface you know everything looks happy and uh you know there's a perfect normality in say like a marriage or a family life but if you just scratch beneath the surface it's just there's just you know, like an ocean of chaos. It's just horrible. And, uh, you know, the best offers are the ones that can get that balance right, where they show the normality, but just underneath there's something wrong. Uh, I think the book that really done that well, uh, the film not so much, uh, was The Shining. Mm-hmm. When I read that, you know, it just seems like, um, you know, uh, Jack and Wendy Torrance, you know, they have a normal marriage with their child, Danny, and they're just going to move up to this uh, hotel to look after for the winter. And then Jack unravels because of the demons of his past and their demons that we sort of were introduced as the book goes along. And they're sort of like um, echo tree, like there's like moments of paragraph, you know, not paragraph, sorry, there's um, bracketed. It's like little voices that are speaking mm-hmm. to him throughout it. And that's a book that really uh, got to me. Um, I remember there was a section in it that sticks out to me. And it's not even in any of, I don't think it's even in the miniseries adaptation of it, uh, where Jack ha- hears his father's voice through the radio. Mm-hmm. And it's just the conversation between the two of them. I was like, I was, at the time I was just in an airport waiting to go to, I think it was Liverpool or something. And I was just reading that part. It was just literally sitting at the, bo- the bar like a pint in hand and I was going oh, I'm just gonna put you away for a second there. <laughs> like this is this is a, like an airport full of people but yeah it really got to me you know and uh, I think that's just the power and you know you know story you know horror storytelling that is one of the great things about Stephen King he can tap into that like real world horror but like infuses it with the supernatural like you were saying like throughout the book you get to see him like slowly unravel there's a quote that I've got written down here Ghosts are real, monsters are real, they live inside us, and sometimes they win. And just the finality of that, like that just sums up Jack's arc completely, and it's terrifying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, well, that's prevalent through all his books. Showing his madness. Mm. Yeah, like even, like I even think of The Stand, it's not particularly a Night right Harv uh, book, but it's the way of Randall Flagg can sort of, you know, he's basically the devil incarnate and the way he can you know seduce people to you know the worst parts of them you know to let the worst part of themselves out and to just be to act on their worst impulses you know it's that their sort of thing as well and it's like you said that's what he writes so well in his books he is brilliant have you read any of his stuff claire no i haven't but i've watched like a few of his films like um the it series and then obviously Mm. the shining uh, what else is by Stephen King that I've seen? Is the Mist? Is it the the not the Mist? Um, that other film. The Fog. Is it the Fog? And the like something like sort of comes over a town and it makes um everyone sort of suicidal. Is that by Stephen oh. King? That book. Um, um, that rings a bell. Are, are you thinking of um? Is it Stephen King? It might not. I even don't think it is. It's, no. um, are you thinking of the happening? Is it? Yeah, I think so. Sorry. I know, because I was going to say, please don't be talking about The Happening. It's not a good film at all. <laughs> no, it's a terrible film, I was going to say. I know um, Mark Wahlberg plants. <laughs> oh, God. Um, uh, I, can't, I don't think it's The Mist. The Mist is basically, there's like uh, something that happens and then these creatures from another dimension come from it to terrorise this uh, town where most of the occupants of the town are, you know, hauled up, hold up, sorry, in a, a supermarket. 
yeah, no, so I don't think it's that that's one. the mist. But the fog is about um, these pirates uh, that have cursed the town and they're coming back to wreak revenge and they're hidden in the fog. Is that what that is? I've never seen it. Yeah, no, me neither. That sounds he's, so creepy. He's had a recent, I remember watching one. Um, is it, I can't remember what it's called. I should have looked this up before. Um, but it, it's on Netflix recently and they're like in a field. It's like really like big, big grassy area. In the tall grass? Like, yes, 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 yeah. in the tall grass. Yeah. Oh, that's a king book. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm. They adapted that uh, for a screen, and I, I watched that quite recently. I didn't get the whole way through it, though, because it was a bit, well, I get scared easily. <laughs> <laughs> Not a bad thing. I, I personally find it really hard to, like, as an adult now anyway, to be, like, really, really scared by something. Like, I might be, like, creeped out, but I'll not be scared. And it's really frustrating, so I'm constantly trying to find a book or a film that really freaks me out. Oh really? Like so? Do you mm. know that like if if something's extremely jumpy, does that not like get you? I think no, I'm just not really. <laughs> I, I wish oh, it did. Yeah. I think it's because I know like what to expect. So if I hear like the music lull, like I'm like I'm waiting for it. So when it happens, I'm like, oh okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh my god, so lucky. <laughs> it's so frustrating. Like I want to be scared, and I'm just not. <laughs> That's it. If like a film's like constantly going right, we're gonna scare you now. We're gonna scare you now. You were ready. You ready? You ready? Boom! Scared you, and then you're like, exactly. "Yeah, I, I could see that coming." So not really that scared. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it, I'd be a bit like yourself, Victoria. It's atmosphere and mood that mm -hmm. sort of really gets to me. It's the stuff like that that gets under my skin, and it sits with me longer. And um, that's why, sort of moving on in terms of another author that done that brilliantly uh, for me, uh, he's someone who's very problematic. You know, if you're looking at through a 2020 lens, but H.P. Lovecraft, you know, he, mm -hmm. well, might as well just get the, you know, get it out of the way. He was a very big racist and xenophobic person. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is very prevalent in his work. You know, when I was reading The Rats in the Walls and to describe the character's cat, I was like, whoa, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, look it up if you want to know, but it's it's bad. It's very bad. Um, but yeah, it's his books. I remember I had uh, an anthology collection. It wasn't it wasn't all of his stories. It was just like a collection of his best. And I think I was on a bus in Newcastle. And I think it was the Dumbwich Horror that I was reading. And it's just a very strange story um, about this, you know, sort of um, this sort of fella that's like half human, half creature that you don't know but it's the way he describes this creature just sort of like what the hell is this and then there's the grander scheme of uh involves you know sort of a, a, cult, a cult that um is trying to bring back uh you know some sort of evil into the world and i think it's you know lovecraft's coldness that works to his effect like he if you're looking for like characters that you can latch on to in a HP Lovecraft story, forget no. it. No. No. He's he's all about descriptions of areas and mood and atmosphere. And he does that absolutely brilliantly. But if you're looking for a character you can warm to or like grab hold of, you're like, nah, it's not gonna happen. Like a lot of his stories start with uh, a narrator who's going mad, who has gone mad and then it's their story and the story ends with them killing themselves that's basically yeah, it. Pretty much. <laughs> you know, it's the template for a lovecraft story but it's the things that make them go mad they get into your head and they just sit there and they sort of just are scratching at the back of your head going yeah but that can maybe happen to you too and you're like what, what? <laughs> oh my you know, god if you let <laughs> almost if you let it in but the thing is the way he writes it it you, you do kind of let it in and it's See, that's the why there haven't been many really successful adaptations of his, um, his books, because it's very hard to convey, you know, mm -hmm. cosmic horror and that sort of dread within it. I think Color Out of Space, which is based on one of his short stories was out earlier this year. It does actually a pretty good job, at, uh, albeit you have Nicolas Cage going full Nicolas Cage, but okay it works. <laughs> but it works, you know, like that's me when he goes mad and it works in the film. Brilliant and uh yeah it's about it's it's a really good story as well um but um 
yeah, uh, it's it, the thing with these book uh, with books is it's it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a hard book to get to. You could literally be just a chapter or something, or a paragraph that can make you go whoa. You could just take it by mm -hmm. surprise. It just depends on how well the author writes it. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the HP Lovecraft um, books, is there ever like a resolve in the ending? Like, do you know, it makes you feel a wee bit better. You feel a wee bit safer in the end. No. <laughs> well, <laughs> funny, the Dunwich Horror kind of does have a happy ending, but 99.9999% of the stories, no, not a happy ending. Uh, yeah, oh, always bad. But that's what proper horror does. The horror, you know, it, yeah. it has to. That's how it really sticks with you when the good guys lose, and uh, that's why I love it so much. But that's why I was tempted to name examples there, but I don't want to spoil it. You just yeah. have to. You have to suss it out, and you have to find the good stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you okay. definitely read some Lovecraft. But just bear in mind, he is a very, very problematic writer. Yeah, that it, like, it can be hard to read sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like acknowledging like the time period he, he wrote in, it only helps you so much when you actually realize what he's saying and what he believed. Like the, the news here, is it HBO's doing it? Uh, Lovecraft Country, they kind of explore it. The main character yeah. is a black fellow and he loves Lovecraft's writing. And part of the dynamic between him and his dad is his dad can't understand why he reads Lovecraft. He doesn't understand why someone would want to, knowing how mm. racist he was. So there's an interesting exploration in that series, which is good at calling it out and addressing it. Mm. Yeah. So it'd be a good companion piece. And, you know, if you read a few Lovecraft stories, then either watch the show Lovecraft Country or even read the book mm. that it's based on, and it'll sort of help, sort of help you in a way reconcile yourself with being able to read this stuff and mm. understanding that he was someone of his time. But even saying of his time is a bit of a cop yeah. Um But it's just a hurdle you have to try your best to overcome but like victoria's saying it is a bit hard to overcome sometimes mm -hmm. see if you are interested in like the idea of his work but don't want to actually read it mm -hmm. there's so much stuff now that like incorporates his stuff there's a book called meddling kids and it's basically adult scooby-doo but it incorporates <laughs> like lovecraft like mythology it's so cool there's sherlock holmes versus cthulhu which is insane <laughs> <laughs> okay, that, that sounds right off my street yeah like it meddling wow <laughs> oh my God, it is so so good and there's such there's great representation in it like there's a lesbian couple that are written like normal people like they're not written to be lesbians mm -hmm. oh yeah it's a brilliant book and because like because lovecraft is someone who might make your skin crawl for the wrong reasons books, yeah 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 it can be more easy to digest amazing so we definitely recommend that um, I read a book on the lead up to Halloween uh, this year, and it's called uh, The Southern Book Club's Guide to Killing Vampires, or Slaying Vampires. Yes. Have you read it? I've heard of it. I've heard a lot about, uh, is it Grady Hendrix or Hendrix? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's based in like the 1980s and the 1990s. Now, just a bit like HP Lovecraft, you know, there's been a lot of people sort of came out of, about it and they were like, they don't like how women are represented. Yeah, I've seen that. But I sort of looked at it while I was reading it. Like I sort of took it as the time it was set in and also like whereabouts it's set in. Like it's it's kind of set in the South, you know, mm -hmm. the, the women are housewives. Like that that's just the theme of the book. Like I didn't find it. I don't know how to describe it because obviously the way he was like, you know, the way he was speaking about the women and stuff, you know, we wouldn't do that now. Like, you wouldn't get away with that now. You wouldn't want to do that now. But it works for the book. It it mm -hmm. helps tell the story. And I don't want to, like, give away any spoilers, but if the women weren't so good at cleaning, then <laughs> it wouldn't work. <laughs> but um, it's it's kind of like, it, it's brilliant the way that um, Grady Hendrix um, mixes gore with humour. So there is, oh, like... Okay there's a good mixture of like um gore within the book but it's not gore in the fact that I'm like oh my goodness like besides myself I'm like oh my goodness I can't read anymore it's like it's kind of like it puts me in mind of um Quentin Tarantino from dusk till dawn with, a, mm -hmm. with like a kind of um like a housewife take on it 
<laughs> it's, it's really really like it's a really interesting read and it's just it, it's like extremely entertaining how he can mix gore with sort of that element of humor as well uh-huh. you're, you're actually laughing out loud at them like doing really horrific things <laughs> yeah i'd heard of it but like like you said like i had heard some of the like other readers problems with it and i was kind of like Okay, I, I should probably make up my own mind, but it did put me off a wee bit. But like you said, like if it, you have to acknowledge that it's set in the eighties, it's set in the south. Like you're gonna have certain kinds of things being said, and if you ignore, yeah. if you ignore that, then you're not being authentic to the time period. Well, exactly. Like he's extremely authentic to the time period. Like you know, there's um, sexism, there's racism, but it's all relevant in that time where it's set and what the book's really about. And I feel like if you um, if you set too much on like hitting that element of it, then you're not gonna enjoy the actual story and what, what yeah, actually yeah. is going on. Yeah, I think that's I fair. Recommend it. I've, I've seen it in Waterstones. I've seen his other one as well. It's um, My Best Friend's Exorcism or something. It looks very Stranger Thingsy, but it, it yeah, looks like yeah. it's fun. <laughs> Yeah, I'm definitely getting that one next. <laughs> yeah, I'll definitely have to give them a go myself. Uh, no, usually I'm a bit stubborn when it comes to books. Like I, I have like a set author and then I just stick with them and read all their stuff. I'm not like, mm-hmm. I don't know, I don't want to try this author because if I don't like it, then I'm going to force myself to read the whole thing and then I'm going to hate myself for it. <laughs> it's, just, yeah. it's just the idea of investing time in something I don't like, because I'm very stubborn when it mm-hmm. comes to books. Like, I, I'm not someone who would, like, read a few chapters and then go, nah, that's it, I'm done with it. I have to read the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Even if I hate it, I, like, I like hate reading. I'm like, oh, I hate you. I'm just reading you. <laughs> I'm just going to read you until I get to the book that I really want to read next, okay? <laughs> so you- that in and of itself is an existential horror and dread that comes yeah. with it. Because you read it so slowly when you're not enjoying it, don't oh, you? Like, I know, and then you, you try and scan book. read it. And, oh. Yeah. No. <laughs> oh, I, I, I used to be like you, Joe, and then I read one that was just so bad that I was like, I can't do this to myself anymore. It was, um, oh, what's it called? I think it's called, like, Cradle or something. It's a John Saul book, and normally his books are a bit... They're kind of like Dean Koontz, but with more violence. But like the violence is really gratuitous. It's it's really like it's meant to make you go like, Ugh. but I don't like that because it, it feels cheap to me. Yeah, che- cheap just- scares are a big no no. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, like, what? Just I suppose there's something that was playing in my mind just when I was going into this year. Like, what would have been your earliest like memory of a, like a pa- certain passage or whatever in a book that just made you go? I can't go any further. I, this is just too much for me, you know, in terms of being too scary. Mm-hmm. Like, has that ever happened with you? I know you're reading it when you were about 10, Victoria, but like, so you probably are scared of nothing at this stage. Yeah. Um, you know. <laughs> the supernatural stuff, like I am more drawn to the supernatural stuff, but it doesn't scare me as much. One thing that sticks out is, have you seen Misery, Claire? Yeah. Yes. Um, I. I, I don't know if I've watched it the whole way through, but that's the one with the um the girl. Or, no, yeah, I don't want to give away any spoilers, but um she becomes obsessed with the author. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. There's this is a bit of a spoiler just for anyone who hasn't seen or read it. In the film, um Annie Wilkes um basically she uses like a sledgehammer to break the guy's ankles. Or to hobble him. In the yeah. book, in the book she cuts his off with an axe and then cauterizes the wound with a blowtorch and I remember reading that just going oh, oh my god but I kept reading and I was like right I need a minute it was, was so that- the way Stephen King describes it is there's so much detail and it's just it was really hard to read so, so, so that was when you were five was it <laughs> <laughs> just <laughs> oh, based on your history with King um... <laughs> honestly no, it was um... so like well, oh, cause I, I, I should probably shouldn't admit this. I, when I worked in a clothing department in a retail store, like I worked six to 10 at night and there was nobody in the bloody store. So I used, I used to keep my Kindle in the storeroom in the back and I would come in, read a couple of pages and then do like a lap of the floor, just make it look like I was doing something. And then I would go back and read it. But I was reading Misery when I did this. So I read that scene, went back to work and was like, what, what do I do? What if someone speaks to me? What am I going to say? 
<laughs> Old Sheldon got his foot cut off. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> he got his foot cut off. <laughs> Like all like the whole night, I was like traumatized. <laughs> yeah, I can only imagine. <laughs> That's the power of king. <laughs> yeah, it is. He is um, very, very good at what he does. Oh, absolutely. Um, like even the well, there's pet cemetery as well. You know, <laughs> uh, without spoiling it, uh, have you either read or seen? Well, have you even seen the film, Claire? Pet cemetery. Uh, I've I've seen uh, bits of the early one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So do you know what happens essentially? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, th- I think I know the whole story mm. without not having um, seen it. Yeah, it's one of those ones that people tend just to know. <laughs> yeah, I think I... that's. Yeah. No, no, I was going to say I think that's the case with all of King's stuff, like his well-known stuff. Everyone yeah, knows. So like ingrained in the culture, like even if you haven't read it, you know, like you know what The Shining is. You know yeah. what it is. Um, um, but obviously, I haven't seen how horrific the um, the film or the book probably is i've heard it, it it makes people cry the book well it's yeah. it, it's the book the king said <laughs> himself i don't know if i should release this because it was he even found it too scary himself he's a bit like ourselves you know he he finished the book and put it <laughs> like, in the shelf and he's terrible. like i'm not gonna release this um but no it's uh it's it's whenever baby gage comes back oh and uh he goes on his wee rampage but <laughs> I make it sound like an. I make it sound like a wee cute thing. Oh, yeah. wee Gage is he's on the well, loose. Well, he's well, just free hook, isn't uh, he cute? Oh, he's a wee mischievous little lad. Um, no, it's not. He uh, <laughs> he gets very stabby, and uh, <laughs> it's very <laughs> it's very horrible <laughs> the way King describes it. <laughs> and uh, mm-hmm. it's it's one of those things where like if I had a, you know, if there was a baby within my family at the time, I'd be like, I don't trust you. <laughs> 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 you're gonna leap out of this crib any second i know you are uh but i'm not like that anymore I'm not, it, does, that's, that's over stephen king does grief very very well and that's part yes. of what makes pet cemetery so scary there's a stephen king book i don't have it on me it's upstairs somewhere but it's not one that people would know like very well it's called revival have you read it joe oh i really really want to read it because oh, i heard it's your one guy of my favorites yeah, Mike Flanagan's supposed to be doing an adaptation of it. And, <gasps> is he? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. And he's already done, well, well Kingy done Dr. Sleep and Gerald's Game. Oh, he would be and, Yeah, he's, he really knows, he knows King and Out. He knows how to adapt the stuff. So I'm really looking forward to seeing it. Very excited about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Re- Revival's very, it's, um, it's about a, a young guy who forms a connection with this preacher in his local town. And the preacher experiences a very very hard loss and loses his faith and it's basically about like his journey into trying to bring his family back it's really really dark but it's not one that a lot of people would know it came out i think it was like 2016 15 but it didn't get a lot of press so it's not one that people would like know very well like unless you read a lot of king you might not know it but king writes grief really really well and like i don't know if he's personally dealt with it like I know like a lot of the stuff in his work is to do with alcoholism and drug abuse and he knows that from mm-hmm. experience and that's why he work he can write it so well mm-hmm. but well, as far as I know he hasn't experienced like grief like to the extent that his characters have so the way he can write that is just incredible I think you know a lot of stuff in his life does reflect his work like you said like um in the novella collection what do you call it um it's the one with, it's got um, the Shawshank Redemption and on that. Different seasons, different seasons. Mm-hmm. Uh, the version of Stand By Me in it, The Body, he said that's based on an accident uh, that happened when he was a child. One of his friends was hit by a train. Oh my God. And, you know, I think oh, that really that? sort of, yeah, yeah. So a lot of stuff like that informs his writing. And then obviously- oh, you up with this. <laughs> Yeah, and then his, the accent that he had as well, just before, I think it was, I can't remember, early, late 90s, early 2000s, when he got hit by a truck. Um, was it before or after Misery? It was after Misery, uh, I think. Yeah, yeah, it would have been after Misery. Uh, but he, um, I think he went in a bit of a depression after that there, because, you know, he was someone who was constantly writing and then obviously he couldn't. Mm. So I think that's maybe informs the likes of, you know, revival, like you were saying, I think it's 
that mm-hmm. sort of depression that just you know comes to the surface now and again and he just mm-hmm. puts it into his writing that probably is the reason why like his books are so believable and authentic mm-hmm. you know because they are like so scary but yeah mm-hmm. like it's it's not cheap horror it's not like paperback 50p horror like his stuff like it has humanity behind it, and I think that's what draws a lot of people to him. Because like, yeah. usually, like I, I very rarely meet like a casual Stephen King reader. Normally, if I meet someone who's read his books, they've read most of them. Like people yeah. are really, really loyal to him. Like I read the Dark Tower series over the course of six months, and whenever a certain character died in it, I. I couldn't read any further for a while. I was bald my eyes. I just really I, I this character just yet. died. Oh, you're in for a treat. Um, the first one is, it's a sort of a weird one because he wrote it when he was really young, but then he decided to continue the series. And I oh. think it's the, it's the second one. I think it's one of my, it's probably one of my favorites, the drawn of the three. Uh, and then after that, uh, the Wolves of Kala is actually a really, really good one as well. But there's so much I want to tell you, but you know what? I'm not gonna because... The more you sort of read on and the more you get into the series, the more you're just like, you know, just the surprise of it all just comes to the surface and it's great. But yeah, really do read the Dark Tower series. It gets a bit meandering towards the end and some people hate the ending, but I think it's just right for the story that yeah, he was telling. Yeah. But like I said, I can't go any further in it without spoiling it and I don't want to spoil okay. the Dark Tower. <laughs> and don't, oh, another thing, don't go anywhere next or near the film because it is complete crap. <laughs> yeah, I, I was not interested at all. It was Matthew McConaughey and Idris Elba, wasn't it? Yeah, it's basically it taken. Bad. It's taken eight books uh, that are a couple of thousand pages in total and putting it into an hour and a half. So I thought we were just seeing the first one. Yeah. It, so there's like just one film. Yes. That's so hard. <laughs> How does that even work? It doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> focusing on like the first book oh my god so did i I thought right you can maybe get away with an hour and a half for the first book because it's the smallest out of the series but yeah i don't think we'll waste our time with that one claire yeah it's 10 minutes for a book Mm. or something like that 20 minutes at the most yeah that's awful like even think i'm trying to think uh series of unfortunate events where they put like the first three books into one film and it like it kind of worked, but not really. So I can't imagine trying to fit that much material into an hour and a half. <laughs> who, who okay? That like who was like, yes, this will be perfect. This will work. Uh, a certain studio that's known to just absolutely mess every sort of franchise or uh, you know sort of book series that it gets its hands on. I'm not going to name them, but there is a pattern, and I'll let you know later. Uh, because I recently watched a sequel to uh, a certain film that was big in the '90s. And then oh. I knew there was trouble signs as soon as the company logo popped up. I would just went, oh no. Oh dear. Oh no. <laughs> and oh, I'm curious. I'll tell you after this. I just, I just don't like slandering you want a name and shame. films in public. Yeah, it's, it's, I, I don't know. I just don't think it's fair, but I will tell you. I will let you know as okay, soon as we stop recording. <laughs> so then you can avoid it like the plague. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, oh. yeah, in terms of... Uh, non hard books there's plenty of stuff in them that just makes me go whoa like um i you know apart from horror and uh you know science fiction there was a phase i went through where i just was madly in love with southern gothic books you know the likes of court mccarthy and that mm-hmm. and the road is actually it's probably my favorite book ever and there's a sequence in it that is just you know it's literally just a horror you know story in and of itself it's whenever um you know, the father and son of the story go downstairs well i suppose it's sort of contextualize the book it's basically a post-apocalyptic book about a father and son trying to p- survive the post-apocalypse that's it in a nutshell uh and the father and son are in this stranger's house but in the cellar um there's basically people are being kept like farm animals so they're just using them to eat and it's the way he describes that it's just literally like it's like it goes back to what i said earlier it's just a paragraph but that paragraph i was just like whoa and then when you watch the film it does do that but it's nowhere next and near effective as what the book does because what 
Court McCarthy does really well in his writing in general is he gets things to the point and they hit you in just the appropriate way. Um, so th- I, when I went in the binge of that, then I sort of went to a further binge. It was like, you know what, this stuff's a bit disturbing, but I could just go over something that's just, you know, racks it up a little bit more. <laughs> it was a bit of a glutton for punishment at the time. Because uh, I couldn't really, it's like, it's like what you're saying, it's hard to find horror sometimes that really gets to you. Unless somebody recommends something to you, but then you're a bit afraid because you read it and then you're like, uh, that wasn't that good. <laughs> and you're afraid to tell them. Yeah. Uh, but it was the books by a, a guy called S. Craig Zeller. He was, a, he's a, you probably know more as a filmmaker. He done Bone Tomahawk, the oh, Western yeah. horror. Yeah, he was an author first. And there's two books of his that are sort of Westerns as well, but they're horrific. Uh, they're not in a bad, you know, not in that they're bad. They're just horrific. Yeah, yeah. Scary. <laughs> <laughs> they're not bad. Uh, yeah, uh, there's a congregation of jackals and wraiths of a broken land. And it's it's the disturbing, you know, it's the nature of the characters and the complete nihilism of everything around them that just makes you go, it just drains you, but it's disturbing and it's compelling at the same time. It's like, I don't know why I'm enjoying this so much, but I'm really compelled to turn to the next page. Like a chapter would end abruptly on a very sour note. And then you would just turn the page and go, I kind of have to keep going now. Um, it's just the manner in which people are killed and how, you know, they'd be begging for help and stuff. And there's like, what help? There's no help. In real life, this is what happens, you know? You think there's like so a, you know, a knight in shining armor that's going to come and get you. Um, I would recommend those two books. They're quite good, but they're very heavy. So don't read them when you're in a bit of a bad mood or no. a downturn. Like... <laughs> Like, funny I mentioned that. Like, re- when, I was, when I was reading Wraiths of a Broken Land, it was my holiday book when I was in Dubrovnik last oh, year. Wow. So, sitting by the pool reading this, and I was going, oh, God. <laughs> if anyone knew what this was about, <laughs> like, even my girlfriend at the time, you know, who's sitting right beside me at the time, I was going, I can't tell you about this. <laughs> I, it's good, but I'm not letting you read this. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. That's amazing. But that, that just goes back Aww. to what you were saying. You know, it is a book that horrified me. You know, it depends mm-hmm. on how you define horror. And, and that is horror in, the sense, mm-hmm. in, in, in essence. So that kind of real life horror is something that I'm, that I'm looking more for. Because like, like you said, like no one comes to help you in real life. And the, one of the annoying things about books is like everything has to be tied up in a neat little ball. And like it doesn't always happen. There's a book, it, it might appeal to you, Claire. It's a, there's a series on Netflix as well. It's called The Alienist. Oh, yes, I am. Um, I think I may have started to watch this quite recently. Mm-hmm. Um, is it is it set in like Victorian time? Yeah, I think it's like um, li- really, really late 1800s. Um, alienist is basically like a Victorian word for psychologist because they the way they understood mental illness was that you were alienated from your true nature. So if you studied that, then you were an alienist. Because when I first saw the word, I was like, oh, this is aliens. And I was very, very wrong. Um, but it basically, it follows um, a team trying to track down this serial killer. But they're using like really early versions of methods we would use now. Like there's a big part of the plot about fingerprints and they're trying to explain to the police like the value of using fingerprints. And the police are like, you're talking nonsense. But a lot of it is they try to get into the head of the killer and figure out why he's doing what he's doing. Like it's a really early example of like modern true crime now. And it's, it's it is not a light read. It is there's a lot of detail. Like, are you familiar with Albert Fish, the serial killer? Ooh. Yeah, Joe's was, Joe was familiar. <laughs> Which one is he now? <laughs> he's a, he was he, um, a, he was a child killer known as the yeah. Grey Man. And he was also a cannibal. Do you know what I think I have heard of this guy? Yeah. Yeah, he he's really like really, really horrific. But I think that's where the author drew a lot of his inspiration from for the villain and the alienist. So like if you're reading that, it is very, very heavy and it's very scary in terms of like if you know if you're familiar with Albert Fish, you're reading this, like someone's actually done this before. Mm-hmm. And like that psychological like fear is very, very scary. It sounds really interesting though. Like I think I really want to 
really it, it is fascinating if you want the series is really really good i was pleasantly surprised there is something about true crime that really engages you it, like I, I don't know what it is that's so fascinating about it i feel like it could be because quite a, the majority of the time the killer has been caught mm-hmm. and you don't have to worry about them anymore so you just like you hear about what they've done and then you know they can't do it anymore I think that yeah, there's like, a weird sense of safety ironically yeah, if you're watching them you're like oh what they did really terrible stuff but they can't do it to me you know <laughs> I don't know <laughs> just don't read about the unsolved ones like don't go into zodiac at depth or in depth oh, or God, anything no. like that <laughs> I've actually got the the book of the zodiac killers um mm. I got really obsessed with the film and mm. watched it like I don't know all the time for a while and uh, until my partner wouldn't let me watch it anymore um, <laughs> and so I, I keep meaning to read the book but you know yourself with like to be read piles like oh god yeah I love but not buy more books and then they just get pushed to the side <laughs> I will read it eventually is it like graphic is it horrific what zodiac well yeah, well, you've seen the first scene in that film, so yeah, yeah. it's yeah. it's it's yeah. An, it's at that level. Um, but yeah, in terms of true crime, I did read one, and somebody got it for me as a present. It just tells you about my friends. Uh, it's about <laughs> the it's a book by the daughter of BTK and about how she coped with knowing who her oh father God. was and stuff like that. So it's not graphic in all in terms of you know who he was. It's it's all about her and her relationship with him growing up and uh, how he's just a seemingly normal father, but he did have these little dark, you know, he, had, well, he did have his dark side, but it would just come out in little p- bits and pieces it took from time to time. And I didn't, it didn't scare me at all. I just felt a lot of pity and sadness for this girl because, you know, her, a whole lot of her life was a lie. <laughs> Essentially, you know, her father wasn't the father that she knew growing up and uh, uh, it was so quite sad. Scary. Yeah, but then there's another thing as well. I read uh, my friend Dahmer, and yes, the way that's it paints, a novel, isn't it? yeah, it it paints him in a positive light. And for a time, you do feel sorry for him. But then you have to remind yourself what he actually done. Mm-hmm. And then you're like, no, no, he doesn't deserve sympathy. He could have turned things around in his life, but um, mm-hmm. he didn't. But yeah, I, I don't want I don't want this going down the route of a true crime sort of thing. <laughs> Just before we move on briefly, my thing with Dahmer is like he, like what he did was unforgivable. You can't sympathize with him, but I think if someone had have helped him, he would have. I don't think he would have done what he did. Like even when he did like his most gruesome crimes, he had to get like blackout drunk just to like have the stomach to do it. Yeah. So that in itself, I. I feel sorry for him in that sense, but at the same time, what he did was so horrific that I can't like empathize. Yeah, it's it's, un- it's unforgivable. Like. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, but anyway, him. any lighter notes there, Victoria? <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you want to me to ruin your childhood? <laughs> yeah, go for <laughs> it. <laughs> this book here, that's probably backwards on your screen. No, no, it's Lost Boy, is it? Lost Boy by Christina Henry. She is so cool. She does retellings of fairy tales. So she has an Alice in Wonderland series and she has a mermaid series. Lost Boy is an origin story for Captain Hook. And it's so dark. It is so gruesome. Like it goes into like, because like I'm a big Disney fan. Like I love Peter Pan. and But Peter Pan pa- paints Peter as this like really playful, fun guy. Whereas this book shows him more as a sociopath. And how like the lost boys don't actually mean anything to him, and it really goes deep into why Hook hates him, and it'll it'll make you change your whole perspective on Captain Hook. I thought it was incredible, but I was not so, expecting it to be that gory. Is, <laughs> does that mean that Peter Pan is like deserving of um, Hook's hatred? Kind of, yeah. You, you'll, oh my goodness, wow. I, I can't spoil it, but there's something that Peter does to him that you're like, no, Peter deserves everything he gets. <laughs> Why, does he like does he like drug him and then lower his hand into a crocodile's mouth and then that's how you, <laughs> is that how it happened? <laughs> I don't want I don't want to spoil it because I was I literally like I gasped out loud in the middle of a cafe like I someone turned to look at me and I was like <laughs> wow but yeah it, okay it's dark that's really I would recommend her work in general like her Alice in Wonderland series it's kind of like a post apocalyptic 
like it's it, it opens with Alice in a mental hospital and she escapes with the help of an axe murderer who she's like developed a weird relationship with. But like it takes oh. you through like the white rabbit is like uh he's what do you call him? What do you call your man in Game of Thrones who like knows every, is it Barcy's or Fairies? Yes, the white uh the white rabbit's kind of like him. And the walrus and the carpenter from Alice Wonderland, they're like drug lords who like do like sex trafficking and stuff. It's really, really dark. Whoa. Yeah. But like if, <laughs> if you look at the cover, you'd be like, oh, that's adorable. I get the child that. <laughs> no, I love that. <laughs> oh my goodness. Does she have a book called Once Upon a Time by any chance as well? It might do. Because I didn't hear. Um, and it looked quite interesting. And it was like a sort of dark tale on the. I can't remember, Once Upon a Time, is that Sleeping Beauty? Yes. Oh, yes, I think I know what you mean. It was like a, it's like a black cover and it's got like the side of the villain's face on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, there's a Mulan one where Mulan has to go like into the underworld to get Shang back. There's one about Ursula. There's loads of it. I haven't actually read them myself, but there is a whole series of them. They sound really like... Don't they? Yeah. I think, I think I've one in my bookcase somewhere, but I'm not, I can't remember which one it is. That would really ruin Disney for you all together, wouldn't it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like Sleeping Beauty itself is kind of dark if you yeah. acknowledge what it is. That's what I mean. Like, funny you mention it. Like, going back uh, to sort of ties into Disney, you know, I, I really liked Hercules growing up. So now I thought, you know what? I'll read what these stories were really like. I'll go into Greek mythology. And oh, 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 oh <laughs> there is a lot of um, stuff that shouldn't be there for children. No. Uh, so then I think my mother got me a sanitized version which was basically a version where Zeus didn't have sex with everyone and uh, <laughs> the funny thing about it was um, you know there were pictures in it uh, the sanitized version now uh, <laughs> not the dodgy version uh, <laughs> but yeah th- it came to the story of uh, Perseus and the Med- and Medusa it's basically Clash of the Titans mm-hmm. And there was a picture, you know, I was reading the story and then you just turn the page and it's just double fold. And it's basically Medusa's head decapitated, but it scared the living hell out of me. I wasn't able to finish the book. I literally like threw the book away and this is when really? I was a child. I, it was just really, really traumatizing. And I love Greek mythology, love the, you know, the stories of heroes and stuff like that there. Uh, but once I read that, I was like, I, I, can't, I can't go back to that. You know, because the whole idea of Medusa is if you look in her eyes, you turn the stone. Uh, so that book was just lying face down on the ground for ages until my mom eventually picked it up and put it in the shelf. And it, yeah, it just really, really got under my skin. That's probably my earliest memory of a book scaring me. And it wasn't so much because of words, I think it's just the pictures. So mm-hmm. um, I like that. Mm, I like that it was I like don't. I like that it was a really, really <laughs> old story that scared you because it it yeah. shows how like enduring they are. Like they're they're well, still have the part of freak you out. Well, without realizing, yeah, it did. The story itself got to me in the idea of, you know, look into the Medusa's eyes, then you're going to turn to stone. You know, I may have thought been a bit passive when I was reading through it, just looking to know, oh, does he does he get back? Does he kill the Kraken and save the day? Uh, but then it's once that he opened it, then pages with the pictures, you're like, okay, now it's starting to write home. That's why everyone's terrified of, you know, Medusa and the Gorgons and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, that was probably my first experience with like true horror in a in a book. I like that you remember that. Do you have anything like that, Claire, that stands out? I don't I, like off the top of my head. I can't think of a book that was so horrific that it made me scared. But I do have one memory that really sticks out out for me. And um, I think I was like seven or eight years old, and I was at my friend's house and we watched the others. Oh. Yes. No, was I that age? I was like, I was definitely younger than 10 anyway. And it was uh, the film with Nicole Kidman. And um, I got home and my dad was in the house, but he wasn't in the house. So he was like, I don't know, he must have been in the garden or something. And I was sitting in the house completely freaking out and like crying because I was like, well, where's my family? <laughs> like, you know, I started to think like the film was like happening to me. And I was like, oh my goodness, am, am I? Um, oh, oh. <laughs> and then he like came out of nowhere and scared the living shit out of me and that's like the like my first really early scary memory but I, I can't think of a book that frightened me as much as that day 
<laughs> whenever I was younger. Why did, did your father like have a sheet over his head and he just go, I am your daughter? <laughs> no, 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 no. He just, I think he just like walked into the room, but I'd already <laughs> worked myself up so mm -hmm. badly from this film that I shouldn't have watched at that age anyway. Oh, no. um, <laughs> And then the fact that he just came in out of nowhere whenever I'd already like agreed with myself that I was a ghost, you know. The <laughs> you already made peace with that. I'm, I'm dead. I'm dead essentially. <laughs> I already made peace with the fact that I was a ghost. Whenever I found out I wasn't a ghost, I think I was even more frightened. Oh dear. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh. oh. I'm Scared of that film. I think that could be like one of the reasons why it's scary movies. Oh, don't worry. Like within Banterflix, uh, Darren, he is terrified of horror films, but I made him a nice long list of all these horror films that are streaming that I highly recommend. I still have it, so I might pass it on to you. Uh, oh. You know, just to break you into the genre. It's fantastic. Once you're in, you're in. Like, <laughs> it's, it's a lot of fun. I love horror. <laughs> <laughs> we can tell. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, just before we wrap up, I'd like to know, is there any like book to film or TV adaptations that you're really, really loving at the moment or any like that you really hated? Oh, uh, in terms of like, ones that I love. Well, there's one that I'm actually looking forward to. I'm looking forward to seeing what to do with The Stand. It's out in December. Mm -hmm. I think it's a 10 part series. Um, I'm a bit hopeful uh, like because the other miniseries, it wasn't that great. No. Um but in terms of uh, like an adaptation that seemed recently, I was like, oh, that's fantastic. Um, nothing. Well, it probably would have been Color Out of Space, to be honest with you. You know, uh, this guy, Richard Stanley, who made that, there's, you know what, you can literally do a podcast on him alone because he's such a very strange and mysterious character, but he's just so fascinating at the same time. Uh, honestly, look up Richard Stanley if you can after this. He's only done a few films, uh, but with Color Out of Space, it's genuinely disturbing. It's funny. It's just got so many different elements and it does cosmic horror really well. And, um, mm. you know, the book itself is set in the aftermath of what happens in the film. So you could actually put the two oh. together. So oh. you, the only problem is uh, the book itself isn't contemporary. It's basically set in the 1800s whenever it was written, whereas the film is oh, modern yeah, yeah. day. So, but it still could read that way because Lovecraft doesn't really mention character. He remembers settings and this is sort of a countryside rural setting where the events happen. So you could read the two and the two, you know, mesh together so well because the author, Stan, you know, not the author, sorry, the director, Richard Stanley, he really understands Lovecraft and he was like, he's always been trying to get him on screen to do him justice because like I said earlier, it's very hard to get cosmic horror mm -hmm. right and so rarely done. So, I'd say Color Out of Space is one of the best adaptations I've seen in a while. And in terms of worst, I've already gone over the dark tower. We're not going to go in there. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Claire? Um, I'm I'm can only really think of um adaptations that I'm really looking forward to. Um, have you guys heard of the author John Mars? Rings a bell. No. Um, he wrote um, The One and The Passengers, and these are both um, oh, yeah. thrillers, but they merge with sci-fi and like there, there, there's quite a lot of element of futurism in it mm. as well, like um, so they give insight to what things are going to be like in the future. So The One is kind of based on um, taking DNA samples and figuring out who your soulmate is. Oh, yeah. Um, so it's kind of like taking a date nap, but like a few steps further in the future. And it's also like oh it's big, um, it, at, during the same time as the passengers. And the passengers sort of like it focuses on, um, you know, like electric, like automatic cars that like just you you sit in the car, you close the door, and it like drives for you. But these uh -huh. cars um get hijacked, and then um the world sort of they're like, like so the world is the audience of the people that have been hijacked, and they get to choose who live and who die. So he hijacks like eight. Oh my god! Cars, and you have to like decide 
like the audience and um, they they hear things like we smidgens about these people's lives and they get to decide whether they deserve to live or die so it's like the moral <laughs> sort of confidence um, but uh, basically the one the one is the first book beforehand now it's not a um they're not like a sequel or anything but they're just based in the same time like passengers sort of mm. like touches on the one but um they're making a netflix series um for the one and um, because it's like it gets seriously very twisted and very dark um just with mm -hmm. like you don't know who your soulmate really is sort of scenario like they mm -hmm. could be extremely evil people can, yeah you know um so they're making a um a netflix series for that which i'm really excited about because just that book i think um last year it was like one of my favorite books that i'd read um it's like it's so gripping and um it's intense and it's brilliant it's, it's like it's um the same with the passengers um it it's in like 10 different points of view but that makes it like the the chapters are like snort, short and snappy so they're really intense so you're like mm -hmm. you're entirely gripped and then there's another book I read last year called The Silent Patient I'm not sure if you guys have heard of it and um, it, it won uh, quite a few awards for like best um, psychological thriller mm -hmm. and um, it, I think it was Brad Pitt's production company bought over the rights to make that into mm -hmm. a film and I'm really excited about that because it's another book that's crazy like the twist is just wow like, I think I read it in like 24 hours and like it, it was one of them books where you just like everything stops and if anyone comes near you you like you bite them like <laughs> don't interrupt my book um and then another I think um the book I'm reading at the minute it's called the Mexican Gothic have you guys heard yes, of that I've heard I've seen this everywhere is it good um, so I'm like I think I'm only like seventy pages in, um, so it's a slow start, but it's like mm -hmm. really sort of gothic. Um, I can tell there's going to be like really spooky elements in it, and it I feel like it's going to go down the supernatural route. At the okay. minute, it reminds me a wee bit of like a 1950s version of the Haunting of Bly Manor. Oh, okay. Um, that's only so far. Like I'm only, like I said, I'm only seventy pages in. But I think it's Reese Witherspoon. Is her um, production company making it into a film Ooh. or a TV show? I I know oh, someone's adapting it, so it sounds interesting. But yeah, that's yeah. all I'm excited for. Um, can't think of ones that I've seen recently. That's going to annoy me after this. <laughs> You'll have like five <laughs> examples as soon as we start recording. <laughs> all right. Uh, I think my one, I was, I'm torn because I watched uh, The Haunting of Hill House when it first came out and I was obsessed. I thought it was like one of the best things I've ever seen. I am so terrifying. Then I read the book and it's just, I find it really, really hard to get through. And I was like, right, maybe, maybe it's, maybe it's just because, because it is very different to the series. So I was like, okay, maybe it's just because I watched the series first. So I read another one of Shirley Jackson's books, which was We Have Always Lived in the Castle, which is about these two sisters whose entire family were poisoned and they're kind of like ostracized by their community because the community knows one of the two girls killed the family, but they just don't know which one it is. Mm -hmm. But it was... <sighs> I feel bad because I like Shirley Jackson as a person and I like what she done, what she contributed to the genre, but I really don't like her books and I feel so bad saying it. <laughs> Especially because, like, Mike Flanagan's adaptation of The Haunting of Hill House was so good. Mm -hmm. So, like, the book part of me is like, how dare you? <laughs> <laughs> how dare you besmirch Mike Flanagan's work with your own work? <laughs> <laughs> At least That's just know, awful. <laughs> he took, like, the best parts of um, what she wrote and, like, yeah. enhanced them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I'm excited to see what he does. Like, I haven't seen Doctor Sleep yet, but... That's oh, it's sort of sequel to The Shining, but not really. It's, it follows you, Danny as an adult. Yeah, you know what? That's actually a great example of where the film's better than the book. Really? See, the book because, I, I enjoyed it, but it was kind of like, eh. yeah. See the meh parts in it. He makes them better. Really? <laughs> and he tight what he manages to do right uh, without going into too much detail. You were the book of The Shining and the film of The Shining are two almost yes. very different things. He manages to put them together and make sense for this sequel. Oh, 
oh okay and that's something that's near impossible but he does yeah. it <laughs> and he, he does it really talked well talked about it months and months ago because i wasn't sure if he was going to follow the book or the film because like if you, claire have you read the the book no is this doctor sleep we're talking about mm. doctor sleep and the shining the shining film and the shining book are so different it, it's, mm. it's hard to explain unless you've read the book so when doctor sleep was announced i wasn't sure if mike flanagan was going to do the book, like the Stephen King version, or if he was going to do the Stanley Kubrick version, but like, do you know if you said he mixes the yeah, two? Yeah, he does like... both. He does both, and they both work perfectly. And it shouldn't, but it does. <laughs> wow. But I honestly, watch Doctor Sleep. I, I, yeah, I that would give me something it's, to look forward to. It's you one of my, to... it's one of my favorite horror films of recent years. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. See, I trust I your it. judgment. <laughs> it's definitely a horror, is it? Like, it's not. You know? uh, oh, there's one scene that. Oh yeah, it is. Uh, there's one scene. <laughs> That involves a certain murder and it's very full on. Like he does like when you read it in the book, you're like, nah, he's not gonna adapt it that way. And then you're like, oh, he's made it worse. <laughs> oh god, this is gruesome. <laughs> Only my pillowcase. <laughs> uh, that, that's it's the power of Mike Flanagan. And um I don't want to spoil it, but honestly, uh I'd probably watch the film before I'd read the book. But if you want to know a bit more, go into the book. Okay. Uh, just before we end, but the thing I'm looking forward to, I'm raging because it was meant to be out this month and I got pushed back, is the new Candyman. Oh, oh I, Clive Barker. Yes. <laughs> Claire, have you seen Candyman, the original? Uh, no, definitely no, not. No, it, it, it's, 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 it's a bit scary. Oh, you don't need to. Just go to a mirror and say his name three times. It'll be fine. Is it three or is it five? <laughs> no, 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 five, isn't it? No, 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 no. It's fine. I want to show up with a hook and then it's fine. It, it's so I'm so excited because like the sequ- it's a sort of sequel but not really sort of mm-hmm. sort of a sequel sort of a remake I don't know what how you would describe it but it's being produced by Jordan Pale's production company who did like Us and Get Out so I'm really really excited for that mm-hmm. and it was meant to be out this like this year it was meant to be out in October but it got pushed back because of everything so that'll give me something else to look forward to <laughs> has there been any Absolutely. trailers or anything released for that mm-hmm. um, uh, yeah there's loads yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, honestly, watch the first film. It's actually, you know, aside from the horror, the social commentary, and it's really, mm-hmm. really good. Very, very mm-hmm. relevant now. Yeah. Even yeah. the second one, to a degree, is actually, I actually really like the second one. Don't go near the third one because it's nope. like a straight to DVD piece of crap, but yeah, Tony Todd still did it. <laughs> um, so I think what the film that you know, what you were saying there, Victoria, this one is ignoring three i don't know if they're ignoring two but they're okay. definitely taking on board one good because mm. i've heard um is, what's her name i want to say virginia madsen but i don't know if that's her name her, her the actress? is helen i think mm-hmm. she's she either makes a cameo or she has like a proper role in the narrative but she is going to be in it and i really, really her. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out apparently but like, just based on the end of the film i was like <laughs> God knows. <laughs> right, as of now, yes. it is 20 past 10 at night. I'm in my jammies, have been since about 7 o'clock. <laughs> so I will let you guys go. Thank you so, so yes. much for taking part. It was really, really fun. And I've got a whole other list of to be read books on my list now. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you so much, Victoria. You know, it's, it's been great. Thank you. Not, not used to hosting, so I'm very. No, you do a great job. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.